Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, DeKalb Library Foundation, and the Decatur Short Docs Film Festival, welcome to our talk back session for the screening of this year's 2021 Decatur Short Docs Film Festival. Many of you may know that the Decatur Short Docs Film Festival showcases short documentaries about people and places in our community and in the South. And they look for films with heart, art, and soul of our diverse region. Tonight, we're very pleased to present several of the directors and filmmakers, along with Hal Jacobs of Hal Jacobs Creative, who's the film organizer and also a filmmaker himself. Many of you may remember, of course, that we showed his documentary, Lillian Smith, Breaking the Silence, which has gone on to garner wide acclaim across the United States and bring the voice of Lillian Smith to many, many individuals. Once we finish our formal presentation with all of our presenters tonight, if you would like to ask questions, we would ask that you type them in the Q&A feature, which you will find either at the top or the bottom of your screens. If you don't find that, you can also just simply use the chat and we'll go ahead and read those questions in turn. We're here tonight to talk about several of the films that have been presented this week. And what we're going to do is have a order of presentation, but don't feel free, don't feel that you need to um, just ask questions during that particular time. So we have tonight Carson Hunt, who is the director of Renaissance Man, which is a film about William, a 60 year old former army tank driver who auditions for the Tennessee Medieval Fair. We're also joined by Julian Martinez Escobar, who is the director of Invisible Hands, about migrant farm workers, in particular, a group of Mexican seasonal laborers in rural South Carolina. We also have Patrick Albright, the director of Walk, Run, Ride, and Live, that talks about a black man who comes to terms with his own health and also discusses the health of individuals in the black community. And finally, we'll talk about 6,000 Waiting, with Michael McDonald and Irene Turner. This film is about three Georgians with developmental disabilities who are struggling with the complexities and the barriers of the state Medicaid waiver funding. Once again, I would like to welcome all of the people that made these films and makes this festival possible. And right now I would like to turn it over to Hal Jacobs. Hal? Thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Georgia Center for the book, Georgia Humanities uh, for helping us with this. This is our fourth year of doing this. And um, we should be doing this at the Decatur Library Auditorium with all a hundred plus of you there, but uh, we're gonna have to put that off for another six months, hopefully maybe a year. Um, but we've been committed to sort of sharing these uh, short films that kind of show us a very diverse South and, and also I think a message of hope for us, uh, something that's out of the uh, mainstream media, something where individuals are going out in their community and uh, documenting people. Um, each of these films is organic, it's hand-picked. This is a uh, slow, short film movement. Um, some of them were submitted, uh, some of them were, were selected by looking at what other festivals are doing. Um, so I just want to appreciate the filmmakers for, for creating this. I want to um, give you appreciation for, for coming and, and watching these online and, uh, and being curious about what other people are up to. Um, we just had Jamie Meltzer join us from Huntsville Station, which um, was one of these films that I think I saw it first in New York Times Op Docs and it's gone on to play about a hundred different festivals. So uh, I wanna add him um, to the conversation here. And so we're gonna start off by just kind of going around. I'm gonna pretend we're on a stage and we're, we're gonna go down um, on the panel and everybody's gonna talk a little bit about where they are, what they're a little bit about their background and a little bit about what led them to make the film that they made. So I will turn it over to the first person on the panel. Great.
Hello, how, are, how is everyone? Um, my name is Carson Hunt. Uh, I am the director of Renaissance Man. And uh, Renaissance Man is a, uh, it, it comes from the Tennessee Medieval Fair uh, and the Tennessee Pirate Festival uh, in Harriman, Tennessee. And uh, I actually got involved with that group in fall of 2017 after being a patron myself. And uh, after several years of, of doing that and experience that and meeting some very wonderful and colorful people there, um, I wanted to showcase something that um, showed the heart of, of what these fairs are. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of videos out there that show uh, a, an interesting and unique side of, of Renaissance fairs, um, but uh, I never really saw one that really captured the heart of what it is with the, the people that, that attend. And uh, that's what this one seeks to do. It, it, it seeks to show and educate people what those fairs are. And it also tries to, um, tries to also tell a story about how it's never too late to start something new because you, you never know what you're going to find uh, if you do. Uh, so the company I work for is Draft and uh, we, uh, they, they came alongside me and, uh, and created this with me and, uh, uh, you know, the pandemic hurt everyone, uh, especially the, the, the live events, uh, community. And, uh, we were not able to perform last year, but it did give us an opportunity to, um, create this, uh, this video. So we're very happy that, that this, uh, was able to be created and, and very pleased with the response that we've had and, and uh, very thankful that you all decided to uh, have it be a part of the, the film festival. So thank you all very much for that. Okay, I guess it's my turn. My name is Julia Martinez. I am originally from Columbia, South Carolina. I'm an immigrant myself. I am the director of Invisible Hands, a documentary that was shot in Rich Spring, South Carolina, about a group of Mexican farm workers who all come from a couple of regions in Mexico as seasonal workers, legally here, working um, at a big, big farm, one of the largest farms for peach, peach farms in South Carolina. Um, Invisible Hands is part of a group of uh, documentaries that was um, sponsored or was part of a grant uh, by Indigrids Labs, which is part of Indigrids uh, Festival and uh, that belongs to an independent cinema in Columbia, South Carolina. It's called Nickelodeon. Uh, as part of that project that they had for 2018 was the rural south and uh, um, I've always been of course as an immigrant being interested in migrant stories and I found this a particular story that I was able to go and spend a few nights with the workers or the migrant workers I stayed there overnight a couple of times I spent quite a few times visiting them and then I we were shooting a documentary at the same time. And just the idea is to see their daily life and to learn from them and their stories, which they are not that foreign to me, of course. And uh, uh, just uh, to me, it was like a way to, a window to show um, the American audience uh, stories of real people uh, of those invisible hands and those invisible people who are back there um, taking care of our foods and that very few people know about maybe, or if they know, they would never think about it and thank them for what they do. Um, as you know, um, most of the um, work done in the farms and the countryside in the United States is done by migrant hands um, many are documented migrants, many others are undocumented migrants, but they are all like planting the seed and working the land and harvesting, collecting, transporting, cooking, and sometimes serving the food that gets to the American table. And that was the purpose of it, just show the stories of a few people and their daily life and if you have seen a documentary, you will see that 
and the conditions in which they live are not the worst ones, but not the best ones, and they are completely isolated. Uh, come here from six months to nine months uh, away from the families. And it's a sacrifice they are happy to do for their families back home. Right, thank you. Uh, am I up next, I think? Hello? Yes, uh, you're you're okay. You're okay. okay, everybody can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So my name is Patrick Albright. I am the director of Walk, Run, Ride, and Live. Uh, the uh, the way my film came about, uh, I uh, I work as a photojournalist for the Department of Defense, and uh, it all started one day. Yeah, you know, I was at work and um, I wasn't feeling so good. Uh, I was having some really weird, awkward uh, pains, you know, kind of in my chest, things I'd never felt before. So I took myself to the hospital. And uh, I did that a couple of times, you know, um, to find out that, you know, what I was worried about was something being wrong with my heart. Um, I found out that there wasn't anything wrong with me. I was actually in pretty good health. Um, but it kind of, uh, it kind of, it was kind of like an epiphany. I, um, I've always been kind of tall and thin, you know, so, you know, staying thin was always pretty easy for me, but I didn't realize that my health was starting to kind of deteriorate until I went to the hospital with the idea that something was wrong with my heart and found out that instead of that, it's more along the lines of, you know, your cholesterol is getting kind of high, you know, start watching your blood pressure and things like that. So I decided to, you know, put myself on a path to better health um, and better, you know, a better diet, better health and just better mental health. And in the process of learning the things that um, I needed to do to get myself back to a healthier state. What I came across was um, some alarming statistics and a lot of them weren't necessarily in favor of, of my race as a whole. I, the, the highest percentage of obesity you know, in the world is you know, African-American people, not Africans, but African-American. You know, we have the highest incidence of uh, you know, high blood pressure, hypertension, um, diabetes, uh, you know, African Americans in this country tend to die around 40 or 50 from things that other races aren't dying from until they're well into their 70s. So for me, uh, it was it was just about, you know, kind of putting, putting that, um, that information out there and, and not just saying, hey, this is what happened, or this is what's happening, but showing an actual person going through the process of trying to, you know, kind of break that cycle of, um, you know, poor health, poor diet, and just, you know, poor medical care in general. So it, it, it's kind of a, it's a, I'm, I'm kind of emotional about it because, you know, I've, I've seen the transformation myself and uh, it's really good to be able to make that and to get it out to where people can see it. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, it seems like I'm focusing on one particular race, the health, you know, everybody's health is important. I know that if you look at it statistically, we seem to be the ones that aren't really getting it, you know, that aren't kind of, you know, seeing it, seeing it for what it is. That's why I kind of focused on us. Every, everybody's health is important, you know, um, and, and I just think, you know, we're kind of at the kind of on, on the bad end of the information we received and the, and, and the care we, you know, we, we take for our, you know, our health and our you know, body. So that's kind of why I made the film. I'm glad people are looking at it though. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all though. So Michael and Irene. Thank you so much, Hal. And uh, great to be with everybody. Um, so because we have two people, maybe I'll do, I'll just say who I am and Irene will then introduce herself and then we'll talk about the film. Uh, it might be easiest that way. Um, so yeah, so my name is Michael McDonald and uh, I'm a filmmaker and I've been working uh, in the disability world, the disability activism world for about 11 years. Um, so uh, one of the things that really drives me is 
trying to understand why it is that people with disabilities are often kind of disqualified from humanity, from the human community, uh, because of their bodies uh, that they're born into, and trying to uh, create a world which uh, sort of sheds that bias and um, and so this film was was one small way of uh, stepping into the lives of three Georgians with developmental disabilities and exploring how they fight for their for their own fullness and how they uh, and their families navigate the systems that uh, pull them down every single day of their lives. Um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me. Irene, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. My great producer. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. We're super excited to be here. My name is Irene Turner, and I have my assistant Kat right here with me as well. Um, I'm the producer of 6,000 Waiting, and my background is mostly in community advocacy in Georgia um, with different areas and nonprofit management. So I've been working um, on a project called the Storytelling Project for the last four years. And the film is kind of born out of that project out of our first year um, where we were collecting stories from people with disabilities from all over the state. And yeah, we made the film. <laughs> Hey, wait, it's even cooler than that, though, because Irene had been with this amazing team, you know, collecting what over 100 stories. Yeah. In the state of Georgia, in every district. And, uh, and then when they brought me on board as the director, we had to choose out of all those 100 powerful stories, what we would make a film about. And so um, I remember the first day we worked together, we had a sticky note for every story and the walls, like all four walls were covered and we were just diving into them and trying to figure it out. And um, over time, we had to make the horrifying choice of just choosing three of the many. Um, but uh, those are the three that we thought there was a bit of synergy uh, between and uh, that we could do with our budget and we could we could tell a story with and so uh, we went from from the amazing work of uh, gathering these stories to sticky notes to then the film that you guys saw what else should, irene should we say yeah. um, i think along with like the synergy of everyone together it was interesting to have those three folks because they're similar in that they share a disability diagnosis that's the same. Um, they're all males. They're all kind of around an age group in Georgia. So, but we looked at their stories with the Medicaid waiver. So like, what did it look like for each of them to try to access that waiver, get on the wait list, wait on the wait list, fall through the cracks and end up in a nursing home? Um, so yeah, it was trying to lift up their stories and their voices to kind of educate and raise awareness for Georgians and, and hopefully make a change. Hal? <laughs> back to you, Hal. That's great. Let's, um, I, I know we'll come back for questions uh, for you. Jamie, would you like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, your film, a little bit about your background? Sure, yeah, thanks um, for having um, Huntsville Station. I'm one of the directors, uh, Jamie Meltzer, and um, my co-director, my fellow director, Chris Philippone, um, wasn't able to be here today, but um, just wanna underline that this was very much a collaboration between us. Um, we came to the idea separately, and then we decided to kind of join forces to, to make it together with a kind of a shared vision of, of what this might be. Um, I had found um, the uh, bus station where the film takes place. Um, the film centers around a bus station one block up from uh, a state penitentiary in Texas. And every day, about a hundred or so 
parolees are let out of um, the prison um, down the street. And many of them meet with folks that are going to take them home. But more of them, most of the individuals that get out don't have a ride home um, and need to go up to the Greyhound bus station one block up and um, and wait for a ride there. Sometimes the ride comes within you know, 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes they wait a few hours. Um, and I had been working on um, a film that I finished in uh, 2018. It was on PBS. It was a feature film called True Conviction. And that film was about um, a group of men in Dallas, Texas, who were all wrongfully convicted. And uh, they were all also uh, found to be innocent and exonerated and compensated through the state of Texas. And when they were released, they started helping other people who were in prison, who they felt were wrongfully convicted as well. And they were trying to get them out. Um, and so I found myself towards the end of making that um, feature film outside of the Huntsville State Penitentiary waiting for a man named Isaiah Hill to come out for this feature documentary um, on parole. Actually, he wasn't found to be innocent, um, which the film goes into, but he um, was able to get out, out on parole after 40 years of being behind bars. So imagine he hadn't stepped foot outside since something like 1977, and this was 2016. Um, he's stepping outside for the first time. And that's when I saw this sort of procession of men um, coming out of this institution with these um, sort of like see-through potato sacks on their back with all their belongings and just walking up the street. Um, Isaiah, the man that we were meeting, you know, was very emotional. It was a very intense scene for me as a filmmaker and just for, for everyone. It was just a, a very intense moment. And um, we went up, even though we were giving Isaiah a ride home and we didn't need to go to the Greyhound bus station, the bus station had a place where you would um, cash um, a check from the state. It was a hundred dollar check um, that Isaiah would get to help him out. Um, and then he would be on his way and we would drop him off at a, um, a halfway house in Dallas. But in any case, I saw this whole scene, which was just really fascinating and profound and interesting and emotional, um, just a whole range of emotions that you were seeing in the parolees and their families. Um, and then at the bus station, you know, just the sense of waiting, like not quite being incarcerated anymore because they had got out, gotten out of the prison, but not quite being free either because they were just sort of stuck at this bus station waiting um, for the bus to arrive. Um, and so Chris and I, you know, both felt he had found the, the same bus station in his research independently of me, um, but we ended up talking about it and realized we had a shared interest in it. And we decided to go down and, and make a film. We knew it would be a great short film because it had this sort of like limited scope of being the, about the release and about the bus station. And we didn't want it to follow them beyond that. There's so many films about the criminal justice system, system the prison system, um, even the process of you know getting out and acclimating to the world. We wanted this to be specifically about this one moment in time. And to really like expand that moment in time in the film and slow it down. And really our, the point of the film is to have the viewer just sit with these men in this strange, uncomfortable even moment. And just to try to build some sense of empathy and some sense of what it's like to be them in that moment. Um, we purposefully kept a lot of information out of the film. You know, usually in this kind of film about the criminal justice system, you're gonna find out like what these men did, how long they were in prison, you know, details about the crime. Well, we weren't interested in any of that. We were interested in meeting them where they were in this moment and understanding cinematically and conveying and expressing in the most cynic cinematic way possible, um, you know, this moment in time. Um, and so for us, it just seemed like, um, you know, in a way, the perfect short film, given those constraints. And uh, we knew when the, the bus arrived and took the men away, that, that would be the end of the film. Um, so I think the, there were a lot of challenges in making it, which maybe we'll talk more generally with all the filmmakers about the different challenges. Um, but um, I think I can just sort of leave it there for now and then see what questions kind of come up or what topics come up. But that's basically how we came to um, Huntsville Station and how we made the film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Actually, I that was my next question was to go around and ask each filmmaker what their biggest challenge was 
uh, what was the hardest thing to pull off. Um, but, but let me just say that every one of you handled the emotions of your situation so well. Uh, I, I, I really respected that. Nobody went too far. Everybody just handled it uh, with the care and, uh, and a lot of compassion and just visually supported uh, the story so well. And I think maybe Joe might have more specific questions as well as, you know, what was the biggest challenge? So I'll, I'll turn it over to Joe for that. Oh, Jackie, well, you know, and I think we talked about this, you know, sort of like in, in the pre-broadcast, how that you know, this particular year, um, and even and we've only been involved with it a short time, but you know, all the films seemed so well grouped thematically that, that it just made this one great arc as you were watching all of them. And then in all the films that there was this sense of isolation, you know, and, and you know, with, in these communities, you know, the people being portrayed were within themselves and had to find some resilience, whether it was reaching out to one person or a group of people or trying to you know, break down a broken Medicaid system, something like that. You know, so I found that thing you know, through, throughout everything and it just knitted these things together so well. But you know, yeah, I would lo love to hear like the, the you know, what, what was the hardest thing in accomplishing these films? And you know, I've got, pages of individual questions that we can just, you know, dive on in, um, you know, but maybe that would be the, the first thing, um, you know, because you, I know you all have probably limited budgets, and as Jamie said, he was working on other projects, and, you know, Michael, you're in Panama, and, you know, and there, there's so much going on in everybody's life, and all these films were 2019 and, two, and 2020, so, you know, right before and right during the pandemic, you know, all of these things were coming out. So yeah, maybe we, we can just go in the same order, start with Carson and maybe talk about, you know, the, the hardest thing or, you know, one of the hardest things that, that you had to deal with in accomplishing your film. I think for, for me, the hardest part for creating Renaissance Man was um, removing myself from it in, in the sense that, you know, I'm so close to the subject material uh, being a part of the Renaissance Fair and the Pirate Fest, um, it it could have easily turned into a promo, and that really was a, a, wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be something that um, was uh, that that really got to say everyone's story, um, but focused through one one particular person through their point of view, because. Um, you know, all of us have the same type of feelings that are in the Renaissance Fair. We, we, we have that sense of community um, that William feels in this. And uh, uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to capture something that, though it was told through his eyes, really spoke to all of us. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that was probably the biggest challenge that I had was, was really just bringing bringing myself out of it and looking at it through the eyes of someone who didn't know anything about this whatsoever you know the audience basically um and uh trying to approach it like that that was probably my biggest challenge yeah well can i say the biggest challenge um originally i had chosen a different farm a different community of um undocumented migrants uh, but probably half an hour from where I live here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, the challenge there was uh, um, the owners of the farm uh, didn't want me there. Uh, so I had to look uh, elsewhere to find another community and get permit from the owners who were happy to let me work with them. And I don't know if it was because the farmers were already all documented with there were work permits from Mexico to come and work here that I was allowed to work there. And because they were actually compared to the other places I went, they were doing good practice. So that was the first challenge to begin with. And uh, the story developed uh, with the actual protagonist. Um, it was, first of all, respecting their privacy and um, learning that uh, even though I had permission from 
the farm owner and their bosses to be there and shoot the documentary, I was still like getting into their private lives, into their dorms, rooms, and bathrooms, kitchens, and and kind of taking that moment, that privacy out of them and trying to get their confidence so they were actually uh, truthful of their stories or just what they were showing me. And, and uh, the challenge was to respect also what they were doing, the hard work, and uh, try to live with them that hard work and getting up early in the morning with them uh, about 30 degrees Fahrenheit and just stay up with them shooting at the same temperature where they were working. And going through the stories that never made it to the documentary since it's so short, but learning how difficult it is to have somebody who has been coming to the US for 20 years and whose grandson had just died in that year and whose uh, daughter-in-law was very sick and all the savings and all the money he had saved for all those years went <laughs> to pay expenses for, of his grandson who never recovered. And now his daughter-in-law who was very sick and then they were just loaning money back in Mexico because the healthcare system of course is kind of the same or worse than here in the United States. And the challenging part I would say was the human part to dealing with that and spending time with them and dealing with their personal stories. Patrick, I think you're next. Thank you. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, for me, I kind of feel like uh, the most challenging part was, well, one, just finding the time, you know, to, to you know, to get everything, to get, you know, my vision shot um, in a way that kind of told the story as I was going through it. Um, and um, I guess if, if this makes any sense, uh, the realization that um, I, I, there's a point in the documentary where I mentioned um, what a healthcare provider told me, you know, um, based off of some information. And if you've seen it, you'll know there's a part where you know, uh, one of the nurses at the cardiologist's uh, office mentioned that my uh, cholesterol was getting a little high, not like dangerously high, but just a little high. And uh, the first thing that was recommended was some type of medicine, uh, you know, and I just felt that was, you know, really odd that instead of saying, hey, these are the things that you could probably do, you know, yourself, like you could change your eating habits, stop eating this, do this, do that you know, and, you know, it was right to medicine here, take medicine, you need to be on some type of prescription. And I think the realization that that was kind of a thing that medical professionals, not all, but some want to do, you know, that they want to get you uh, onto a prescription, as opposed to giving you a natural way to, you know, to kind of fix whatever's wrong with you. That, that, that realization was really, really hard for me because I have friends that are doctors, I'm my own personal, you know, uh, physician, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close with. And uh, it was really hard to kind of see these people again. And it, I, I always wondered, like, are, I mean, is, is this what they're doing? You know, are, are they trying to do this to me? Or, are, you know, are you, you know, trying to get me onto a prescription for some reason? I, I don't want to get too much into, you know, whether or not there's anything going on between doctors and pharmaceutical companies, but the realization that there could be a reason other than my health that someone would want me to uh, to be on some type of medicine was was really hard for me, um, and uh, to to have to single out a, a, a particular race. I mean, I didn't. I, <laughs> Like I said, it's, it's really hard to, to, to sit here and, and to say, okay, black people this, black people that, but I mean, I, I am African-American. So, I mean, I have, I have a unique perspective within my community because I, I'm in it every day and I, you know, I see it every day. So it, I, I want to talk about these things for, for everybody, but it seems like, you know, I, I had to, I was almost forced to narrow the focus down to just a particular race because seeing it with my own eyes, you know, every day, um, just 
kind of it just it just made it you know it made me feel like I have to kind of I, I really have to approach this from a racial standpoint which you know I don't like to do I mean we're all we're all people we're all humans you know so I, I it was really hard to just kind of narrow it down to a race but I felt like that was the thing to do and and you know aside from that just finding the time you know to 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 shoot it like I wanted to was uh a challenge Right. Yeah. Do you want to go or do you want me to go? Um, I have one. Um, I think in the process of filming, a challenging area was explaining the history in the Medicaid waiver system. Um, Michael and I interviewed a bunch of people that were involved at the time when things were happening um, and things were moving in Georgia and moving in a better direction. And then we interviewed people when Georgia kind of took some steps back. And that story had a lot of ins and outs and a lot of history and context for it. So um, yeah, that was challenging to kind of boil it down to what the core of the story was um, and then explaining what the Medicaid waiver does for people with disabilities. So that's when Michael came up with stop motion sequence and, and we should put that in. So that was a whole endeavor and fun adventure on its own. And I think it worked. We had well. never done stop motion before. So we yeah. had to learn, we had like a week to learn it and execute it because there was no archival footage of the event that like two minutes of the movie was covering. <laughs> Sorry, keep going, but yeah. yeah. No. That was it. It was it was awesome and fun, but yeah, we had to learn, and we did every single piece of that um, and made it happen. So yeah, yeah, that was really hard. Um, and I think I think for me, the thing that was the hardest was uh, um, probably it's probably the hardest in every film, in my opinion. But you know, I talked about the sticky notes. By the way, sorry, there's there's a jam session going on in the room next to me and a street soccer game going on behind me. So if there's sound that you're here. Um, the hardest thing I think is it was going from those sticky notes on the wall to souls on a screen. And that responsibility uh, that Yuli and you were, you were kind of speaking a little bit about, that responsibility of carrying it from the reductive place that you begin where you don't quite know uh, much about this person to the place where you're going to create this film and you still don't know an infinite amount about them, <laughs> but you want to capture an essence of them. That was really hard. And one of the things that was particularly difficult in this film was, you know, we, for those of you who saw it, um, we had characters who had lots of polar opposite experiences, um, for example, or th things that are kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, Naomi, her son with cerebral palsy, her question was, what's going to happen to him when I die? Uh, Nick, his question was, would I be here if my mom were still alive? Would I be stuck in this nursing home, Nick, who has cerebral palsy himself? Uh, ben was really proud of being Southern. Um, and, and we heard about the hospitality of even Naomi talked about the hospitality of the ramp of a friend who built a ramp into their house just so that they could visit. Um, and then at the same time, in the same breath, we heard about the hostility of 25,000 unmarked graves in Georgia of people with disabilities, uh, who, who were buried under serial numbers. Um, that hospitality is real. It's just as real and palpable. And so is that hostility, you know? And then Nick from New York, he comes to Athens, Georgia, and he experiences it like a utopia where people actually care about you, unlike in New York City, where the sidewalks are actually wide. Um, and at the same time, then he gets stuck in a dystopian nursing home that he can't get out of. Um, so 
really trying to carry the complexity of these individuals' souls with, with all of their, um, you know, vacillating emotions and opinions on things, but their one clear uh, proclamation that they are a Georgian citizen that has a right to live a free life. And as Ben says, like, what is it that I read that he said? He's like, I just want a, a mediocre American life, drinking beer, hunting deer, and praising the Lord. But he has to fight for that because of the body, the body that he's been brought, born into. And so the responsibility of being a witness to those three stories, which don't even touch on the other 97, which don't even touch on the other how many thousand in Georgia, which don't even touch on all the other 800,000 in the United States. That burden is uh, so scary whenever you make a cut or whenever you throw in a sound effect or whenever you decide to do a stop motion. It's, it, that anxiety is uh, the hardest thing to deal with because I'm always terrified. Uh, are we actually transferring the sticky note on a wall to a soul on a screen? Or in the process, did we lose it? And is it, is it not a soul on a screen, but it's, it's something else, something more reductive, something less? And um, I think that's the thing that scares the crap out of me. That's the hardest. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both. Jamie, I think it is your turn now. Great. Yeah, I, I connect with what Michael's saying. I think um, we do have a responsibility as filmmakers, um, you know, to the people, people who are giving us of their time and, and for, for, and that are opening themselves up to, to our cameras. Um, and um, in Huntsville Station, it was a strange situation. And this is related probably to the main challenge of the film, which is that we didn't know who we would encounter at a, at on, on any given day. The film is cut and presented as one experience of one afternoon, but it's actually taken from eight or nine days that we filmed outside of this bus station. Partly that's because some of those days would only be about 15 minutes long of shooting. You know, we'd wait you know, several hours for the parolees to get out. Then we'd follow them up to the bus station. Then we'd meet some of them. But if the buses came in 15 minutes, then that was the end of our production day that day. And no matter what connection we made, you know, they had to go on to um, wherever the next stop was. Um, so that was part of the reason why it was made over eight or nine days. But we also wanted to represent the range of emotions and sort of like tones and experiences that we found in this place. And, and I think it took that many days of filming of filming to uh, kind of capture and uh, get it, have enough material to to represent the depth of emotions that people are, are feeling in, in that um, moment of being freed, sometimes after, you know, 30 years in prison. Um, and uh, just took meeting a lot of people to um, to get that right. So but um, another challenge of, of this film was, you know, in, a, in an ordinary or conventional or a traditional kind of mode of making a documentary film, you're able to meet with your subjects, you get to know them beforehand, build trust with them. But we couldn't really do any of that. We just showed up and, um, you know, kind of be there and tell them what we were doing and introduce ourselves and try to build a connection in this moment as best we could. Um, the main, so the main challenge was really getting them receptive to being filmed and building up enough, enough rapport with them so that they were comfortable revealing their emotional selves to the camera. Um, because we knew that this was a, a moment fraught with emotion and that we wouldn't be being honest or truthful with the audience if we weren't able to um, show that. Um, but that also takes a lot of trust on the side of the subjects to feel that way. I kind of feel like with documentary film, this film and other films that I've made that the camera itself in an interesting way is this sort of like catalyst for people to express their emotions and that much more than it shutting down or intimidating people, it actually allows them this space because you're giving them this attention with the camera and attention is sort of saying, 
you know, I'm, I'm interested in you. I, I think you have something interesting to show or to say, or just how you are in the case of Huntsville Station, where we didn't interview people, just how I'm interested in, in who you are and how you are in this world. And um, I think the camera sort of became this kind of catalyst for people to express their emotional selves ultimately. Um, and that, that was difficult in the film because they were just getting out of prison and uh, in this prison, you know, that they were coming out of and, you know, some of them just for, you know, some months or a few years, some of them for decades, um, they really had to sort of like guard their emotions more carefully than you would in the outside world. So um, it, it, it took a little while to get people to open up to us, but I think the camera was actually some a tool that was helpful towards that versus something that was a hindrance. Um, I think, yeah, the hardest thing was, I think, you know, documentary, you go in expecting one thing. I think this is true, I'm sure for everyone on the panel, you, you know, you kind of know what you're getting into to some degree, you've done as much research as you can, but then hopefully you step in to the world that you're filming and it's just different in some profound ways. Um, and part of the documentary process is adjusting um, and making a better film than the one that you imagined by responding to what actually spontaneously happens in front of the camera. Um, and so with this one, there were a lot of um, challenges and unexpected um, kind of moments. And, um, and um, we had, I think in a way, the film is close to what we wanted to do at the outset. But I think the main thing that maybe is most different and that was most challenging was um, kind of just sitting, being able to, to um, I think the thing that we found in the first few days of filming was that the most beautiful moments were these moments where where really the the camera just was sort of sat there um, and witnessed someone just sort of being in their own moment rather than talking to someone else or talking on the phone, just almost like a moving portrait and a moving um, photographic portrait in a way. Um, we We found that those moments were the most powerful and we hadn't really anticipated you know, that that kind of moment, but we started building on what we had and, and filming more and more of those. And that I think in, in the film, you'll see in the sort of, I guess, second half of the film, it's a 14 minute film, uh, probably from, you know, nine minutes on, it really turns into the series of slow meditative portraits. And I hope that those, while they're like a little bit uncomfortable, I think in their, in their length to, to sort of sit with them, I also think that's where kind of like the most, um, empathy can come in, in, in this, in, in, in watching this film in, in those moments of, of just being with someone, um, someone you may have preconceived notions about, or someone you may in real life not be able to spend this kind of time with, not have the privilege of that. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I always think that in documentary, the main challenge, the hardest thing to do is to kind of adjust to what life gives you and make something that um, is at the core what you intended to do, but in another way is kind of radically different um, from what you walked in expecting. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jamie. And don't forget, if you all have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A section. Jamie, I actually want to follow up real quick. Um, as well, because I, I, you know, love how you're talking about trust and emotions and empathy. Because um, when I watch Huntsville Station, you know, you know, watching these guys break down and have that emotional moment and, and seeing the one gentleman who's telling you that he's been in prison for 30 years versus the sort of like long shot of the guy that's just sitting on the curb and you watching it happen silently as he goes through the experience himself. But what I kind of also found very stark was that, you know, these gentlemen are experiencing this um, and going from sort of like one, you know, broken system that we have. And then all of a sudden they're thrust back into this predatory capitalism and, and watching the bus station owner selling time on cell phones and terrible sugary drinks that no one should probably be drinking and paying five dollars for them um you know i was like they're, they they we're, were just with a hundred dollars that they're given you know knowing that they're being given it's just we're moving them from one system literally to another and, and you know i found it kind of shocking it was one of my i need to take a walk moments because it would you know 
you feel that now we're supposed to be helping individuals who have been recently incarcerated, you know, acclimate to society. And the thing we're, we're doing is just throwing them into predatory capitalistic situations. Yeah, well, I'm glad you picked up on that. I mean, that was definitely something that we experienced in at the bus station. I think it's a mixture, though. You know, the the people that run the bus station, the the man that you're talking about actually is just someone who um, kind of shows up there every day. And part of his hustle, you know, he calls it a hustle, um, is um, you know selling phone time to these parolees who you know can't afford a phone in that moment, but really want to call home. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's a complicated, he also sells them the perfume later, but he doesn't own the bus station. There's um, another person who's managing the bus station and the, the manager is selling them clothes and, you know, food and, the, you know, the, the drinks and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that they're coming out of this system, this prison system, which is, you know, of course, unimaginably like, you know, cruel and oppressive in so many ways. Um, but I feel like at the, the point that they're in the film, the, the, when they come out, you know, they they probably understand what those rules are. And then they're stepping into this situation of this bus station. The rules are kind of laid out for them. Okay, you need to be here. If you're not here, you'll miss the bus. They kind of lay out like a little bit of a list of rules. And it almost feels like they've entered kind of another prison in a way. Um, and you don't necessarily know this in watching the film, but I think it maybe is suggested about these sort of like frameworks that you're talking about of, of the sort of like capitalistic or predatory kind of framework that happens at this bus station. I think we can expect that they'll they'll experience that in other ways, like over the coming days and weeks in different in different ways, and that there's not going to be a lot of support for them. And there really is about them kind of fending for themselves. So we did want to give a, a sense of that, a sense of how hard it would be for them. Um, and where can they find solace in that? I think there's some solace in just sort of um, appreciating the moment that they're in maybe, um, but I think there's a lot of hesitance um, and I, we, hesitancy. And I, I, I felt like we felt like this film, it was really important maybe for, for none of the moments to only have one side to them that, that they should be excited, we imagined about their freedom, but at the same time, they should be like hesitant. We should understand their, their hesitant nature about um, what what they're stepping into i mean what are what is going to happen to them i think that's very much an open question um in the film so we we really tried in this film to again leave out a lot of information and really try to just provoke a response like you had as a viewer and maybe just provoke a set of questions about the criminal justice system and about the support systems that we do or rather don't provide for these uh, men and women coming out of prison and the hundred dollars is just not sufficient for anything. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, well, speaking of, of you know, in, incarceration, I also found it, it very interesting um, in invisible hands. So, you know, what I found interesting, Julian, is that, um, you know, these men who you know, were working with the system, you know, were, were guest workers, um, and, you know, we're coming to America for an opportunity to do jobs that, you know, clearly Americans did not want to do because they were so strenuous and out in a, in a field that, you know, like Huntsville Station, you know, I, I felt that they put themselves into a, some kind of prison within the system that, you know, they literally were going from field to camp on a bus very much like you see prisoners being transported and, and sometimes to a laundromat to do their clothes. And, and, and you know, it, it had this very isolating sense, this, this you know, and a, and a sense that these men were almost captive to a system, you know, that, that they were seeing as an opportunity to try and help their families um, back at home. And what I also found very interesting is that so many of the things that these men said about working long hours and you know having to miss birthdays, having to miss graduations. You know these are all things that you've seen in every '80s movie about great American capitalism um, and making millions of dollars in music. And I just felt that if you know white people could see these men saying these things and realize that 
it's the same things that white men trying to climb the ladder of success said, that there would just be so much more commonality and so much more empathy with that in that situation. Yeah, it's um, unfortunately due to budget, I couldn't uh, pick him up uh, from uh, their cities in, in Mexico where they come from, where the bus paid by the farm, by the company, takes them and where they say goodbye to their families. And it basically, they leave their hometown on a bus uh, all the way from the heart of Mexico to southern US to this tiny place in, in South Carolina. And so it's a long, long journey. And when I asked them, where, where do you stop? What do you do on the way here? It's like, we just stopped to use the bathroom and get something to eat and back on the bus because we need to be here soon. And as soon as they get uh, to the farm, um, they are, we have medical examinations. They are given uh, sheets and, and cleaning products like toiletries and <laughs> And it's basically, it's a type of prison. You saw the buses, they're white. <laughs> they are white buses. Uh, they, they got doctors for their service. And these are, in a word, privileged workers. They are clean facilities. They are clean facilities. They, they have kitchens that are clean. Uh, they come to mow the lawn around the, the camping area, the, camp, the, the grounds, and uh, it's a nice place compared to the other places I went. They have no control for the state and for nobody. This is clean, this is nice. Yet, uh, the other places, undocumented migrants and documented migrants are from other farms, they get to come and go. These guys can't go anywhere. As you can see, it's a joke, like, yeah, we, we go, we, where have you been? To the laundromat? Their longest journey, longest trip that they take is to the flea market. They love the flea market. They didn't get to shoot there, but they go to the laundromat, to Walmart, which we couldn't get permission to shoot, of course, and to the flea market. And some of them get to, they believe they were gonna be coming back next year. So they chip in and buy a car and which they use on Sunday sometimes when they have free time. They work from Monday through um, mid Saturday and in high season, like when it's summertime, they work seven days a week. Seven days a week, they cannot say no. If they, if, if they say no, they will send back home. Seven days a week, even though they are supposed to be regulated by the, uh, uh, the labor uh, standards and the laws of the South Carolina and the United States that they should have their leave uh, when they are harvesting peaches and other products, they don't have a day off. They just don't. And um, I went there mid-May, uh, mid it was only 80 something degrees. And uh, that didn't make it to, to the documentary, the, the harvesting. It was extremely hot already walking those, those, those fields. I can't imagine August, like September as we live here in the South. It's extremely, extremely hot. And again, when I was shooting in February, in March, it was 30 degrees and it was drizzle falling and it was cold. It was really cold. It was, it was painful to be outside with a camera shooting, but I wasn't doing the, the hard job that they do. And yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's like, a, it's a prison, a paid prison, <laughs> I guess. Prison where you get paid and you get to help your families back home. Thank you, Julian. So I kind of want to talk about health and I, kinda, I want to bring in Michael and Irene and Patrick um, because both documentaries talk so much about communities and community health in, in, in different ways. Um, and I, I have to say, I, I loved the subjects of six thousand and waiting, and and I think any quote Ben says in that documentary needs to be put on a T-shirt, um, because it, it's 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 the gospel according to Ben. It is just, yes. but I, I think it lightened a lot uh, of the heavy subjects in, in the documentary um, as well. But you know, both of your documentaries, you know, talked about communities that are 
being underserved and being marginalized by the healthcare system. And, um, you know, it's, it, we, we kind of all know this, I feel, but it's just not, it doesn't seem to be getting out to larger groups for us to pay attention to this and, and say, you know, we need to, um, you know, make sure that, that people with disabilities are served just as well as anybody else. You know, we're still having a, a, a national health care, you know, debate. Um, and, you know, and like Patrick says, you know, so many communities like the Black community are, you know, you're, you're being pushed to medication, you're being pushed away of thinking you're not being served um, the way a, another community would be served, that, you know, has affluence, has access to, you know, better insurance plans and things like that. So what, what from your film, you know, what, what can we take away from, you know, sort of like this ongoing healthcare debate and, and what we can do as citizens in Georgia to make sure that our folks in Georgia are being taken care of? Am I going first? Take it, Patrick. No, oh, okay. All right, sure. Uh, well, I think um, I think uh, the thing that I want people to take uh, take away. I think you kind of explained it. Um, th there, there is there, there's a difference in, in in the way you know members of, of my community are treated medically. Um, we tend to, I, I, you know, not get the treatment that we we should. Um, a lot of times, it, it comes down to resources. Sometimes we don't have, you know. We don't have the right, the best insurance, um, which we know in our society is, is is a reason to not get the best care. But the, the thing I want to I want people to take away from the documentary is that it's not 100 percent society's fault. We can't we can't say it's all society. Society does not control what, how we eat. I mean, I understand some people live in food deserts and they don't have access to the healthiest food. Some people don't have access. I've been fortunate. Yeah, we, we stay in a great neighborhood. I've got, you know, Whole Foods and fresh markets everywhere. Um, I own a, three bikes. Uh, there's there's a, a, a gym within walking distance, a track within walking distance. So I can get a lot of exercise. A lot of people I've, I've heard, uh, they don't, they can't, they can't afford bikes. Bikes are expensive. Um, running is, you know, they don't feel like running or walking because they don't necessarily feel safe in the neighborhoods they live in. They don't have a way to get somewhere where it's safe so they feel like they can't exercise but what i what i want people to take away is the, I, I hate this is gonna sound weird but those are those are kind of those are excuses you can still even if you can't get to a track or you don't own a bike or you, you know you don't own a gym membership you can still exercise around your house there are things you can do within your own home to 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 to, to improve your health and i feel like if we if we blame the medical system 100% for the state of our health, then we're not taking responsibility of the reason we had to go there in the first place. A lot of it comes down to tradition, what, what we're told is good, what we eat, a lot of that we can control. So what I want people to take away is, I'm not saying, oh my God, we're, we're just being you know mistreated 100% and it's all everybody else's fault and it's the system. And you know I don't want people to take away that. I want people to take away, I want people to walk away knowing that I want to, to look us as a community square in the eyes and say, look, a lot of this is, is on us. A lot of this is on the way we take care of ourselves and how we treat people who, who try to live better. I've been told by people, you know, like if I have a salad for lunch, I've had people say, why are you eating a salad? I'm like, well, I'm trying to eat a little healthier. And the response I get is, well, you're gonna die someday anyway. You know, and that's kind of a, a thing in our community. It's like, you're gonna die from something, why not? eat whatever you want and enjoy it. And I always respond that I, I know I'm going to die. I don't know when, but I know that while I'm here, I want to live the best life I possibly can. I want to be as healthy as I can while I'm here. So, but what I want people to take away is just, we, we can, we can, we can make it better. The system is a little, you know, skewed, but I think if we started to take better care of ourselves, we, we'd find ourselves in the hospital a lot less, you know, and then, maybe a, a, a little bit of a few of the things that are happening wouldn't necessarily have such a big impact on us. I, I know that sounds kind of weird, but that that's kind of where I'm coming from here. 
if, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, to totally understand. Thank you so much, Patrick. Irene, Michael? <laughs> I guess I unmuted like uh, a millisecond before you. Um, so I, it's an amazing question, Joe, and it's great to listen, Patrick. Um, you know, we, okay, I think the typical approach when you're asked to do a film about Medicaid waivers, which, you know, people could fall asleep right away just hearing that, um, is to talk to the experts who can explain what they are, how they work, um, to discuss the system. A typical film about someone with cerebral palsy often would be approached by explaining what cerebral palsy is medically, you know, kind of going through all that sort of stuff through the health angle. Um, we, we were very intentional because we had a, you know, a small budget. We didn't have time to do everything. We didn't have money to do everything. So who were the experts that we were going to turn to? Was it going to be policy experts? Was it going to be medical experts? Um, we decided that we thought the experts were the ones who uh, were experts on their own existence uh, rather than on their quote unquote condition. And um, so I think there's, there's something about uh, 6,000 waiting where we actually wanted to like step away from the health conversation a little bit <laughs> to say, um, what is at stake here? What is that? What is at stake with the whole conversation of medical waivers? Is is what Nick said when he was in the nursing home, looking out the window and it was raining, and he said, "Why am I here if I'm just going to die in obscurity?" That's what's at stake. There are there are plenty. There are hundreds of thousands. You know, there are millions. If you go around the world, people who, because of certain systems, are asking themselves that question, why am I here if I'm just going to die in obscurity? And um, I, I want to say one thing I, I do want to acknowledge is that, you know, I've, I've worked with people with disabilities all around the world, so I've seen a lot of uh, tough situations. I've, I've met people who have been locked in cages for 30 years. Uh, I've met people who, I mean, the, the types of extreme responses people have to disability, uh, it, they're just harrowing. In the United States, until the mid-1970s, there were a group of laws called the Ugly Laws. And you could be jailed and fined if you had a disability and you stepped outside in the public sphere. <laughs> Your very existence was considered a disturbance to others. So I want to say, like, on the one hand, we've come a long way uh, with the American Disability Act, with the fact that those who do have a Medicaid waiver uh, in Georgia usually, like Ben when he got it, can live a full life. They And the fact that that's a possibility, it's been a struggle that people have fought for for a long time. So the fact that that's been fought for, you know, needs to be acknowledged. And at the same time, there's still so many people who are stuck in situations like Nick, full of life. Nick used to be an independent living advocate. That was his job. His job was to help people learn how to live independently. If anybody knows how to navigate the systems, it's Nick. If anybody knows how to realize a dream, it's Nick. He was constantly helping people realize their dreams. And here he is stuck saying, I think I might die in obscurity. Um, if he did, it would not be because of a failure of his imagination. It would be because of the failure of our imagination. And I think that's what we, we really wanted to drive home here by going into the back door of the question, which is to say, these are the humans who are on the forms that are stacked up and getting dusty on the waiting list. These are the humans. And here's what they're living. And here's what they're loving. And here's what's making them terrified at night. 
So that's sort of what I wanted people to feel um, and also to feel the hope that they're still pushing. We've gotten this far. There are no ugly laws. When I said ugly laws, Joe, you, you maybe have heard of them because you seem like you have, but most people, they don't even know what those are. That's because people have fought for that. That's amazing. So now this is our, these are the next ugly laws <laughs> and we got to bring them down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, in sort of like prepping for tonight, years ago, we actually did a program. There was a book um, that was written by a professor here in Georgia. It was called Three Generations, No Imbeciles. And um, it was about a case of, of uh, the forced sterilization of a woman in Virginia um, who um, was, was deemed mentally retarded. Um, she was raped and, and of course had a child with disabilities. And it was Oliver Wendell Holmes that said that um, in, in his ruling on the case that he thought that three generations of imbeciles was enough. And yeah, so I, and then when I saw in the film, of course, all those unmarked graves, I was like, oh, this just, just took me back to the Decatur Library in our auditorium where I first heard about these unbelievable laws that, that you know, sort of restricted people with disabilities and, and um, that, that it was, it was legal. It, it was perfectly legal, to, you know, to, to sterilize people against their will in the United States because of this, so. Sorry for, I had to interject. Irene, if you have anything else on that? No, I think Michael said it beautifully. Um, the only thing I would add is just to emphasize that the film is um, for people to connect and understand, but it's also a call to action. So there are um, a couple of ways to get involved right now. It's an important time. So on the federal level, there's an act being discussed, um, HCSB, that would uh, enable everyone who needs services to get services. You wouldn't have to apply for a waiver. So that's kind of what we're going after in our call to action. And I would just encourage everyone who sees it and is moved to join us. Excellent, thank you so much, Irene. So we do have a question from Rebecca um, and, and kind of sort of want to do this question and then maybe wrap up afterwards. Um, so, you know, folks, time is precious for folks who got, you know, things to do and more films to make. Um, but Rebecca, of course, starts with a compliment. She says, all beautiful stories, thank you. Um, as many of you mentioned, these are very personal stories and you needed to build trust for them to see their true selves. So she is wondering if any of the individuals in the films have been able to see their film and if so, what was their impression? Um, and maybe let's start with Carson with that one. Yeah, William, actually, he did see the film and uh, he's uh, he was really uh, excited about it, excited to, to, to see himself there. And I think the, the biggest takeaway that he had from it was uh, empowerment. Um, and he was he was really empowered uh, after watching it. And he signed up for a. Um, talent agency and so now he's trying to do some some other uh uh types of acting work and everything in and around the area he has a very particular look um and uh, i told him uh, i said you know you could be the um the south's version of danny trejo because <laughs> you know danny trejo is not in every single film but uh, when you need a danny trejo that's uh, that's where you go uh, but uh, he really enjoyed it. He um, uh, is also very excited about kind of being an ambassador for Renaissance, uh, Renaissances uh, all over the country, Renaissance fairs all over the country, um, because, you know, it's, uh, it's something where uh, the more people understand what it is, uh, the more people go to it, the more people go to it, the more people are employed, um, the more... Um, the, the more imagination that is fueled to. Um, I knew I was onto something special when the first time I went to the Tennessee Renaissance Festival, I had my two young children with me who are now, now participants in the fair with me. Um, but I knew I was some, onto something special there because a week after we left, um, they were playing all sorts of different types of games and, and things like that, that they, they were emulating what they saw. 
at the Renaissance Festival. And uh, uh, I had to put a stop to the jousting, though. So that was when I went too far. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it's it's a wonderful thing. Um, very, very excited uh, for uh, for for what it will do, uh, you know, as it continues to uh, get eyes on it. And uh, and, you know, the film really when I say the, the you know William was empowered by it in all honesty he was headed down that path already even if the film wasn't there because he found the community and the support um, that he had always been looking for and uh, I think that that's the um, that's one of the biggest takeaways that I wanted people to get out of Renaissance Man was being able to jump out uh, and try something different. Um, and cause you never know where that's going to lead you. And, and you never know what type of, um, community that you're going to enter into. And, and, you know, it may be something that you've always been looking for and you, you never knew, um, you needed. Uh, Carson, one quick comment, the, the relationship between William and the other young man, it was just so understated and so special. And I'm just wondering, I mean, how you, you kept it simple, but I'm sure there was a lot more to it that 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 relationship brought William sort of out of his shell, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Joffrey lives right next to William. They live in the middle of nowhere. Joffrey, I could honestly, I could probably do another documentary just about him. Uh, he's completely off the grid um there's no electronics in his house uh, uh aside what you know he needs um but um there's uh you know he runs everything through solar power he's got goats uh I'm, he's the person you're going to go to if the apocalypse happens it's those guys uh but uh yeah i i think that having him there close by definitely um you know, who knows if William would have done the fair if Joffrey hadn't been able to drive him to there, because uh, at the time, William didn't have a vehicle. And, and so um, I think he was wanting Joffrey to be a part of it. But I also wonder how much was um, I, I need a ride. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, it's a it's a fun relationship that they have. And and they and Joffrey is still in it with us, too. So, Julian, have, have any of the gentlemen seen um, Invisible Hands? Uh, unfortunately, they were not able to see the final product, but they were able to see some footage and some pictures that I took. I went back to them. I had some phone numbers, and I had talked to a couple of them back in Mexico at the end of uh, 20... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just forgot which year it was right now after the pandemic, I don't even know what year it is. I got to talk to them and then uh, I had the same um, um, phone numbers, uh, WhatsApp numbers. When I tried to reach them back here at the farm, uh, th those numbers were never answered. So I don't know if they got to come back or not. So for that reason, I was never able to share the final product with them. The ones, uh, the footage that I showed them, I was like, please keep it with you. Do not show it outside of the camp. Don't make it out to um, Facebook because we haven't even, uh, haven't shown the documentary to anybody yet. So don't, don't make it public. To, uh, don't make this footage public. Just share with um, amongst you, but don't share it out of, of the group. That was all, but they couldn't finish. They couldn't see the final products. And thank you, Yulin. Well, you know, Patrick, we know, we know yours is, um, of course, with you, but how, how has how you found the response to your film? Uh, well, I think, uh, you mean from like people in general? Yeah, you know, or maybe like even, even family members. Oh, uh, okay. even, yeah. Mm, family, family members. Uh, well, for me, fa family members were, were kind of surprised when they saw it because they they I'm not when it comes when it comes to issues like health, I, I don't necessarily I kind of have a problem of dealing with things more internally. So all of the stuff that I was going through, I think only my wife really knew about it. And I don't think she 
I know she didn't know at the time how much it was affecting me. So family members saw it. And the first thing they were like, we didn't even know you were going through this kind of stuff. Um, but generally they liked it. They, um, they, they, thought it, they thought it was true, you know, true to who I am. They felt like this is, this is you being you, not, um, you know, not trying to, you know, be, you know, pretty or be, you know, something other than yourself for the camera. You are being you, you are showing you in your true form. So it was generally well received. Uh, I, um, it, it actually inspired a couple of family members uh, to uh, start looking at their health a little better, which for me is pretty much all. I mean, if I could inspire one person to take a closer look at their health, then I feel like I've accomplished my goal, but it was, it was, it was pretty well received. Uh, I, um, I've been to a couple of other festivals and uh, um, with the film and uh, it's just amazing when people come up to me afterwards and they have these, these stories about, you know, issues that they've had with their health. And they're like, you know, that was, that was me at one time, you know, or I, I've, I've gone through the same thing that, you know, you, you went through or that you're going through and uh, it, it, it's always good, but as a whole, I think it's been pretty well received. Excellent, thank you, Patrick. Michael, Irene, have, have, have um, Ben and, and Nick and, and Noah and Naomi, they, have all, they all seen the film? Yeah, there's a principle in the um, disability activist world called nothing about us without us. And um, it was really important to us that we shared uh, the rough cuts before we even really finalized it, but not too rough, <laughs> um, with them to see if they felt like we had uh, kind of gotten them. And, uh, and it was great. The reactions were really great. Um, one of the things that's really special about documentary is, you know, if you talk to somebody for four hours, you can just take the most eloquent moments of those four hours and put them all together. And when they hear themselves with that eloquence, you know, they said every one of those words, but they, it actually took them like four hours to get to those moments. But now you just line them up one after the other and they're like, holy moly, I sounded great. So Ben's dad, uh, I told Ben when I sent him the rough cut, I said, okay, this is just for you. This might change a lot. I just need to see like, if you think we're going the right direction, you know, I know his family because we hung out with his family a lot, <laughs> which was amazing. But um, I'm like, just, just watch it on your own, Ben. So I call him right afterwards. Ben, what'd you think? And I'm just so nervous. And Ben's dad grabs the phone. The room is like full of like all their relatives. And his dad's like, you made my son look like a badass. And, <laughs> and Ben was just like, oh my gosh, I sounded so like, you know, great. I sounded like I was like in a documentary. And you know, it was just, it was really, really cool. And, uh, and Nick just loved it. He's like, everybody has to see it. I, again, I, and, uh, Naomi too. The only person who we don't really know what they thought of it was Noah because he's nonverbal. So uh, Naomi said that Noah likes it and Naomi's the one who really uh, understands what he communicates the best. Um, and he was there for the interviews and you know uh, we, we, we made sure that she showed him the footage before we moved forward but he's the only sort of question mark where uh, we're disabled and understanding what he really thinks. Um, so he, everybody loved it, but with Noah, who knows? I hope, I hope so. Yeah. Irene, did you have any stories? There's also like yeah. fun stories afterwards, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so definitely they've all seen it. Um, and I think a really cool thing that's come out of it is all three of them are really good friends now. Um, and we have a, a Zoom meeting every other week um, with Nick and Ben and Naomi, Michael and I are on there too, where everyone and there's like a larger group of people were just brainstorming, like, how can we get Nick out? What's the next steps and going down um, the like really complicated path of that. But yeah, I love that they're all really close now. They haven't met in person yet, but um, I know Nick and, and um, Ben talk every day on the phone, so it's really cool. Thank you so much. Jamie, how, how about yours? Were you able yeah. to, were any of the guys able to see it? 
Well, yeah, it was an interesting situation, um, similar to the challenges I described um, in, um, you know, connecting with folks um, right when they got out of this um, prison facility. Um, we we had them all sign releases, you know, as you do in a documentary, they have to sign a legal release. And at that time, you get their full name and their phone number. But in this case, most of them or all of them did not have like proper contact information that you would have. And um, so we haven't we don't know where really any one any one of them are. Um, uh, and uh, I think it would be difficult to 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 find them, although I'm curious to do it. I just haven't had the time because at the time that we finished um, and we premiered the film was around the time of the pandemic. It was shot you know, well before the pandemic, but I've been locked out of an office that I have for about the last year and the, that has all the releases and the names in it. Um, so I'm interested to try to track some of them down um, and just to, you know, of course, share the film with them. It's just... And it was just such an interesting process because, again, you would normally in a film, I would create these really strong connections over years, you know, of, of making a film and then years of getting a film out and the outreach and going to festivals. And this was, you know, not at all that experience. Um, all that said, it was a really profound, even to some degree more profound than some people who I've known for, for years in, in filmmaking, some of the connections that I made just in the moments at the bus station were just really intense, like really connecting moments. Um, and I think partly because they were so ephemeral and, and momentary. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm excited to try to get it out to, and I keep hoping that someone will reach out to me from, you know, seeing it at a festival or seeing it on OpDocs, it was on OpDocs and, um, but their frame of reference, when when we would tell them, you know, we're making a documentary, you know, everybody has a different concept of, of what a documentary is. You know, when you explain that to people, you know, sometimes you hear about, well, PBS or um, Netflix or, you know, their frame of reference for most of them was like, well, is it going to be on YouTube? Like was the thing that they were asking. So maybe once we put it on YouTube, that's the way that most of them will eventually find it. I wonder if even some of them remember that they actually even were did this film because I think they all signed releases, of course, but I think the moment for them was so emotional and, and big and our presence, even though it would seem very disruptive having a camera and a sound person there, um, you know, what was probably kind of minor given, given what they were going through. So I do wonder if some of them just even like kind of in a way forgot about our presence. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the story there. Thank you, Jamie. How do you have anything before we wrap up for the evening and, and wrap up this version of Decatur Short Talks? I just I just want to say thanks to everybody. I mean, I, I don't hang out with other documentary filmmakers. This is the um, most I've hung out in over a year or so. And um, so much of what you've all said just resonates with me and my work and things that I deal with uh, alone or with my son who I work with and another colleague. But I don't hear these things articulated very often. And, and everyone did such a great job of doing that. And I just, I'll probably go back and watch the, the, the recording of this uh, act after it's posted. And Jamie, I, and I will just say, I'm so relieved to hear that your shooting took place over eight to nine days because I just assumed that was one afternoon and you guys just grabbed, you guys just grabbed every perfect moment there was, you know, within three or four hours and I'm, you know, it just blew me away. So that's the thing. There's so much work that goes into crafting these things that people never realize, you know, and it, and it just takes so much perseverance and sort of tenacity to just stay with it and, and, and turn out something that's five minutes or 10 minutes or 12 minutes, you know? So I, I hope that we can spread the word uh, more, you know, not only with yours, but with others. And I hope when you do more work in the future, you'll think of us and, and maybe even come to Decatur next time and uh, talk to a live audience and go have a beer afterwards uh, with us. Uh, Joe, thanks again for your your excellent moderating skills and what you bring to it. Your insights from coming into it fresh. I just love to hear what you've got to say about it. 
Oh, well, you know, I mean, how it, it's it's well known indicator in, in places far and wide, but I have a lot of opinions. Um, so, you know, I, I am I'm more than happy to share those, you know, either in a building or or virtually. But you know, thank you for for you know bringing this to the library and and into the center for the book and. You know, thank you all for these stories. I mean, you know, like like the mission statement is. I mean, these were stories with heart. I I, I don't think that um, you know anyone can take away anything other than you you all just captured something very emotional and something that's clearly resonant with everyone who's seen these films this festival and hopefully when they see these films anywhere else, um, whether it be on YouTube or another festival. Um, that they take away that same sense of heart, um, you know, that they take away a call to action, you know, to, to either get fit, to write your Congress people, um, um, you know, to work at a Renaissance fair um, or, or you know, follow your dreams in, in some way. But I, I think it's very important. I think the form is very important and, and we're, we're just pleased to participate. So thank you, Hal, Irene, Carson, Michael, Patrick, Julian, Jamie. Uh, for all that you've done um, and for giving us this festival this year. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. You're, having us. You're a great moderator. We're going to enjoy talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you all. Thank you all so Bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you for allowing us into your homes tonight, and we will see you all very, very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.